Hey guys, welcome to this week's podcast episode. And I've got I'm delighted to introduce Christy Jones. She's the startup expert. And today's talk is all gonna be about sales. And she's the author of Selling Your Way In, and she's a speaker coach, she's a, helps individuals develop their sales ability. Um, it's going to be a very interesting uh, conversation around pipelines, close rates, targets, and i um, happy to welcome Christy to the show. Welcome, Christy. Christopher, thanks so much for having me on. Yeah, I know. Um, so kind of tell us about your journey to set the stage and, um, you know, we'll dive right into it. Sure. Um, I actually grew up in an entrepreneurial family. My dad was the owner broker of a Coldwell Banker real estate franchise, and my mom was a top agent in town. So I say that I got my MBA at the kitchen table, um, listening to them talk shop all night. Uh, Our conversations at the table revolved around out-of-town buyers, commission checks, listings, those type of things. So I definitely uh, came by sales uh, honestly and organically. I love that. I love, um, you know, most of the learning happens at the dinner table, um, which I love. Um, so the, uh, so one question is, um, you know, for, um, sales, how do you, you know, what is the first thing that you do when you help other people? Like, is it through close raise? Is it, is it through uh, leads? Talk about how you help, um, your clients and your, uh, your, um, and, uh, people that come to you. Sure. Uh, Most of my clients are early stage startups or bootstrapped privately held companies, usually between zero and five or zero and 10 million in revenue. And so one of the things that seems to be lacking in that type of um, life cycle, if you will, of organizations is formal sales processes. So I always say like, you know, I can't fix a broken process or a half-baked process. So one of the first things I like to do when I come in to help, you know, generate additional revenue, which is normally why I'm brought in so we can drive more sales, is to make sure that processes are formalized, they're documented, they make sense, everyone's on the same page. You know, not everyone is doing their own thing. I don't like it to be the wild, wild west. So thing number one that I do is, is formalize all the processes, make sure the CRM matches as well. Um, that's a that's a critical and you know game changing tool for those of us in the sales industry. And then secondly, I start to evaluate again how we're doing against those processes. I find that the majority of companies who are struggling for from a revenue perspective just don't have enough deals in their pipeline. So they're you know I, I call it the anemic pipeline problem. So there's no way you can hit your target if you don't have enough deals in your pipeline to hit it. There's, you know, there's maybe no amount of, you know, a high enough close rate to do that or average sale based on current close rates and average sales. It's, you know, it's easy to do the reverse sales math, as I call it, to figure out just how many deals in the pipeline that you need in order to hit your targets. And so what I'm finding is most companies are struggling with what I call top of the funnel. They just don't have enough leads or new prospects coming into the top to come out the bottom. And so we spend a lot of time talking about how we're going to get more people into the top of the funnel. And then, you know, we can worry about discovery calls and moving people through the pipeline and negotiation strategies and closing strategies sort of later. If we don't have enough coming in the top of the funnel, none of those things will truly matter. And it puts more pressure on all of those things as well. So most importantly, we need to make sure we've got enough deals to close and hit the targets that we want to hit. I love it. So is it all about numbers? Because I had another uh, podcast guest and we were talking about sales and sales agent and we were talking about just different communication style, you know, a lot of um, people rubbing clients the wrong way. So is it more just kind of like uh, numbers and just kind of building a pipeline and then after that, refining it with personal development, mindfulness? Is that how you approach things? Yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely it's twofold, right? It's a quantity and a quality game. But we can't just live on quality alone. We absolutely have to say the right things. Um, but we have to have, you know, it, it is an activity in a numbers game initially. Uh, the other thing I say is right now, I think as a profession, especially sales leaders, we've fallen a little bit too far to the right. Um, and we've been spending a lot of time talking about the science of selling and the science of sales. And we've gotten away from the art of selling. Um, so, you know, just because we have all the numbers, right, or we have all the data, At that point, I think we're spending less and less time teaching people the art of sales and sales soft skills. So I am spending a lot of time doing that. But after I've after I have fixed the funnel problem, um, coming in and just teaching people how to have better conversations, if we're not having enough of those, you know, first and foremost, we have to have enough of those and then we can have better conversations. Yeah, one of the um, 
one of the uh, things that I commonly encounter is, um, uh, and I know sales is sales is like a, you're you're very, you know, you're very driven and you got a personality and you love to, you know, they love to talk as well. And um, I, you know, one, you know, one of those we'll talk about, you know, kind of the soft skills and you know, I, I love how um, it's kind of um, sometimes it's you know it's one way, but um, talk about how you incorporate mindfulness um into your um practice yeah i grew up as an as an athlete so i believe in the mind body spirit combination so i think and you know of the top 10 percenters that i spend my time with and that i'm trying to coach into the be to be a top 10 percenter i think people miss that mind body spirit connection the bottom line is if you're not you know getting enough sleep eating right exercising you know have a spiritual or mindfulness practice finding some way to deal with stress um, sales is a very stressful profession. <laughs> if you're not, if you're not at the top of your game physically, mentally, and spiritually, personally, how on earth can you perform at your best professionally? Um, you know, the data, the data doesn't lie, as I say. And so if you look at the top CEOs in our country, the, you know, with even the Fortune 500 CEOs, almost all of them start their day at the gym. <laughs> you know, at 5 a.m. at 5 30. They know that they need, you know, the most consistent exercisers are morning exercisers. I happen to be an afternoon exerciser because I like to defrag at the end of the day. And I've been consistently doing that my whole life. But they say that the most consistent exercisers are those who start their day. So there's no distraction. There's no happy hour. Uh, there's no meeting running late uh, to give you an excuse to not go to the gym. But there's a reason why the top leaders in our country and the top corporations in our country start their day off at the gym. Yeah, I love that. And, you know, studying top performers, entrepreneurs, CEOs, it's kind of like almost, I would say, 70 to 80%, um, you know, do that. Um, so how do you um, how do you reach top 10% status? And um, you say it doesn't happen at work and it you know, takes work behind the scenes. And uh, talk about, you know, what that looks like in yourself and also in, in a team. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I say the work to get to the top doesn't actually happen at work. And it's a lot of the things I just talked about. It's the, you know, mindfulness practice. Um, I do, you know, I do visualization. I do affirmations and affirmations. Um, I happen to have um, a hypnotherapist for business. And quarterly, I meet with her to discuss the business goals. And she fills my head um, unconsciously or subconsciously with that information and the success around that. So I truly believe, I mean, you know, top athletes are not just going to get on the court after not having a good night's sleep, having had a cheeseburger and fries, um, you know, and, and just come from the casino. Like that's just not, they may, maybe the night before the big game or two nights before the big game, they were from the, at the casino, but not the night before the night of the day of the, of the game. So, you know, I think it's, it's really understanding. And then the other thing that I think is a huge component of top 10 percenters is lifelong learning. And most of the top 10 percenters, I say, instead of watching The Bachelor, you should probably grab a sales book. Um, and so a lot of people are not, you know, educating themselves. It's so easy these days, by the way, like if you don't want to read, there's Audible. If you don't want to do Audible, there are podcasts such as yours. So I think getting information from top professionals is easier than it's ever been. And I spend a lot of my time listening to podcasts. Um, I do like Audible, but I probably spend twice as much time listening to podcasts um, as I do Audible. I just drove. Um, I'm in St. Louis. I drove from Kansas City to Kansas City and back this weekend. And I listen to three podcasts. Um, you know, I've got that kind of time. And so, um, you know, when I'm out for my walk, those type of things. So it's so easy to get information these days that uh, for personal development and professional development that there's just no excuse. But that's what top ten percenters do. They make time. You know, they don't even find time. They make time. They understand how important it is to be a lifelong learner and to constantly be feeding your brain with information that's going to be helpful. Yeah, I love that. And, you know, I love Audible. I used to, yeah, I, I used to, um, you know, there's a great saying, you know, we, li in, we live in the age of abundant information. And now it's um, the people that use that information to transform and take action. Um, you know, the information is everywhere. It's all abundant. So... And I love this uh, top 10 percenters, you know, for sales professionals, how do you pick the right role for you so that you can achieve your greatest success in owning your own income? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm spending a lot of time talking about that right now. Um, I think the reason why some people are not getting to the top 10 percent is because they're selling the wrong thing in the wrong industry, you know, in the wrong role with the wrong company and the wrong <laughs> boss. 
<laughs> and so, you know, I think in order to reach the top 10%, you have to have put yourself in the right position, selling the right thing in the right industry with the right company, the right boss. And so I see so many people and I'm just, you know, I think we spend a lot of time just talking about hunters versus farmers, but it's not just that, right? Like, should you be selling a $20,000 product or a $250,000 product? Should you be in the healthcare industry selling into healthcare or manufacturing or other software companies? Like making those decisions, I don't think we're taking top 10 percenters are, but I think the other 90 are not being intentional or proactive about their careers. Um, if you ask, I bet if you surveyed, you know, 20 sales reps, I bet 80, 80% 80 of them would say that they're in their current job because a recruiter called them out of the blue, <laughs> you know, and that's reactive, right? That's not taking ownership for your career. That's being reactive versus proactive. And it's, it's funny because we spend our whole life as salespeople looking for the ideal customer profile, you know, reaching out to the right company, the right people within the company to help us better improve our close rate. And yet with our own career, we're not proactively calling companies and sales leaders and saying, hey, I've got skills that I think will fit your organization and I can come in and change the game for you and your team. We're not doing that. It's so interesting that we wait for the phone to ring either, you know, you know, my buddy just took a new job at this company and he thinks I'll love it. So I should go over there. Or again, more often than not, a recruiter called you and said, boy, do I have got a deal for you. You know, yeah. that's not how we should be handling our, our career. And that's not how top 10 percenters are doing it. They're being very intentional about every single step in their career path along the way. And they're making those decisions, not other people. I really love this approach um, to your career. And, um, you know, especially what you talked about product industry company boss yeah, for sales. Uh, and I love how you kind of systematic and you integrate um, uh, mindfulness and personal development in it to create the best outcome for you. Um, for sales leaders, how can you create a sales culture of accountability? Yeah, um, there's a lot of lacking of cultural of accountability out there. And it's not just sales leaders. Sometimes it's an entire organization. But for us, it's an objective sport, right? Sales is an objective sport. So not having a culture of accountability means that you've got players on your team that shouldn't be on there, which hurts morale of the entire team. And so the first and foremost thing you have to do is set expectations, right? You have to you have to be very clear about what you expect because you cannot inspect what you don't expect. And so making sure that those are clear, that they're in writing, and if they need to change, like you can't just set them on January 2nd and expect the expectations to be the same on December 31st. <laughs> and so, you know, it, it's an ongoing negotiation with your team members, with your sales professionals as to what's needed, right? What the company needs, what the team needs, what they need individually. And so you have to hold people accountable to that. And then there have to be consequences. And again, there's no reason to wait until something bad happens to discuss the consequences. P team members should know up front, here are the expectations and here's what will happen if you don't meet expectations. Right. That should all be laid out. That shouldn't be a secret. It shouldn't be something that we discuss only when they're at 60 percent of quota instead of 90 percent of quota. Uh -huh. And so you've got to lay out the expectations, the consequences. And then you you have to, as a sales leader, it's your job to coach, train, mentor, lead and manage. So the, the leader wears a lot of hats. It's not just leader or manager. It's also coach and mentor and trainer. And so if you're not if you, you can't, ex you know, I always say this, that expectations is a two way street. Your sales team member should say to you, well, then what do we, what can we expect from you? How do we hold you accountable to making us better? And like I mentioned, you know, not, we talked about earlier, I think there's a, a lack of the art of sales being taught right now. I think leaders are relying on AI, bots, data, all of the tech stack, if you will, with all the data information in it, but they're not teaching people how to hold discovery calls. They're not teaching people how to do interactive software demos. They're not teaching people, you know, how to control the sales cycle and hold prospects accountable throughout the sales cycle or how to negotiate in the best interest of, you know, in a fair and in the best interest of both companies and all parties. And that's, you know, so if we're going to expect things from the sales professionals on our team, they in return should be able to say, well, here's what I need from you and here's what I'm expecting from you. And accountability goes both ways. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. And then fin finally, uh, your book... Um about it um tell individuals uh, you're the author of selling your way in and um kind of discuss the uh you know why did you decide to write this book what is it about and um and uh how can people benefit from uh checking it out yeah 
it's a lot of what we've talked about already. So I didn't want to write a how-to sales book, you know, how to better negotiate or how to do a better discovery call. I can teach all of that, but I think there are lots of people out there and lots of books out there that have already taught that. And so instead, I wanted to help people get to the top 10%. So um, like the first section of the, of the book, and there are three sections is you've got to know yourself before you get to know the prospect. So that is like, you know, people who have self-awareness are putting themselves in the right sales roles, selling the right things in the right industry with the right company and the right boss. Mm. And so I, you know, I spend the first third, third of the book teaching people how to figure that out. And then I spend that second section giving them options, right? There's lots, there are 30 plus, 50 plus different sales jobs. Do you need to be, should you be in a commission only role? Should you be in a base only role? Should you be in a 50-50 base and commission role? Should you be selling a product? Should you be selling a service? Should you be selling yourself, right? So there's so many different sales roles out there. And yeah. I think people, you know, only think about the hunter role. So I wanted to give them more information about how to put themselves in the best position because the second, the, the subtitle of the book is the playbook for setting your income and owning your life. I believe that in some cases, people are leaving two to $5 million of lifetime income on the table because they haven't put themselves in the right sales position to win. Uh -huh. And then um, Christopher, the last thing we talk about in the book is what you and I've spent a lot of time talking about today is creating abundance. The mindset matters, you know, physicality, spiritual, spirituality, the mental side of the game, and then how all of that ties together. And that, that again, it's no surprise that people who are at the top of their profession, no matter what they are, even if it's not sales, understand the mind-body connection and how all of those things that they do after they leave work, you know, in the evenings and on the weekends is what helps them get to the top Monday through Friday. Yeah, I love that. Uh, how can people find you and uh, reach out to you and work with you? Sure. Um, I would love for you to connect with me on LinkedIn and let me know about your one takeaway from today's podcast. I always love hearing what, what resonates with people. And then I would also love for you to go and pre-order my book. Um, you can go to sellingyourwayin.com and it's available lots of, in all kinds of bookstores. So pick your favorite, favorite bookstore. Um, but sellingyourwayin.com will get you all the information you need to get that book on order so that it arrives in your in your mailbox in August. Yeah. And for all the audience out there, let's thank for the uh, wonderful um, podcast interview and um, really uh, inspiring. Be sure to check out Christy's social media, give her a like and follow her book. And um, with that, thanks so much for coming on. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure.